Chapter 15, How to Handle Resistance and Solve Problems This chapter is about taking the trial and error that's inherent in human interaction and increasing the pace of discovery, by learning to handle resistance and solve problems. Most of us think of settling a dispute as something akin to verbal boxing. You pound through your arguments until you get what you want. Much more elegant and effective models are the oriental martial arts, like Aikido and Tai Chi. There, the goal is not to overcome force, but to redirect it, not to meet force with force, but to align yourself with the force directed at you and guide it in a new direction. That's precisely what the best communicators do. It's important for us to remember that certain words and phrases create resistance and problems. Great leaders and communicators realize this and pay close attention to the words they use and the effect they have. For example, what would happen if you had a communication tool you could use to communicate exactly how you felt about an issue, without compromising your integrity in any way, and yet you never had to disagree with a person either? Would that be a fairly powerful tool? Well, here it is. It's called the agreement frame. It consists of three phrases you can use in any communication to respect the person you're communicating with, maintain rapport with him, share with him what you feel is true, and yet never resist his opinion in any way. Without resistance there is no conflict. Here are the three phrases. I appreciate and. I respect and. I agree and. In each case, you're doing three things. You're building rapport by entering the other person's world and acknowledging his communication rather than ignoring or denigrating it with words like but or however. You're creating a frame of agreement that bonds you together. And you're opening the door to redirecting something without creating resistance. Let me give you an example. Someone says to you, you're absolutely wrong, about something. If you say, no, I'm not wrong, just as strongly, are you going to remain in rapport? No. There will be a conflict, and there will be resistance. Instead, say to that person, I respect the intensity of your feelings about this, and I think if you were to hear my side of it you might feel differently. Notice, you don't have to agree with the content of the person's communication. You can always appreciate, respect, or agree with someone's feeling about something. You can appreciate his feeling because if you were in the same physiology, if you had the same perception, you would feel the same way. You can also appreciate someone else's intent. For example, many times two people on opposite sides of an issue don't appreciate each other's points of view, so they don't even hear each other. But if you use the agreement frame, you will find yourself listening more intently to what the other person is saying, and discovering new ways to appreciate people as a result. When you communicate in this way, the other person feels respected. He feels hurt and he has no fight. There is no disagreement, yet new possibilities are also simultaneously introduced. This formula can be used with anyone, no matter what the other person says, you can find something to appreciate, respect, and agree with. The key to effective communication is to frame things so that a person is doing what he wants to do, not what you want him to do. It's very hard to overcome resistance. It's much easier to avoid it by building on agreement and rapport. This is one way to turn resistance into assistance. One way to solve problems is to redefine them, to find a way to agree rather than to disagree. Another way is to break their patterns. We've all found ourselves in stuck states, in which we recycle our own mental dirty dishwater. It's like a record stuck in a scratched groove, playing the same tired refrain over and over again. The way to get the record unstuck is to give the needle a nudge or pick it up and put it somewhere else. The way to change a stuck state is the same, you need to interrupt the pattern, the tired old refrain, and start anew. The best way to deal with that pattern is to show how easy it is to break. I'm always amused at what happens when I conduct a therapy session at my home in California. It's on a beautiful piece of property overlooking the ocean, and when people arrive, the surroundings tend to put them in a positive state. They come upstairs, and we talk a little, it's all very pleasant and positive, and then I'll ask, well, okay, what brings you here? Immediately, I can see their shoulders slump, their facial muscles droop, their breathing become more shallow, their voice take on a tone of self-pity as they begin their tale of woe and decide to enter their troubled state. 
What I usually do is say very forcefully, almost in an angry or upset manner, excuse me, we haven't started yet. What happens? Immediately they say, oh, I'm sorry, sit straight up, resume normal breathing, posture, and facial expressions, and go back to feeling fine. The message comes through loud and clear. They already know how to be in a good state. They also know how to choose to be in a bad one. They have all the tools for changing their physiology, changing their internal representations, and changing their state in order to change behavior right on the spot, in an instant. Through doing this, I've found that confusion is one of the greatest ways to interrupt patterns. People fall into patterns because they don't know how to do anything else. They might mope around and become depressed because they think they'll evoke sensitive, caring questions about what's troubling them. It's their way of getting attention and using their resources in the best way they know how to change their state. Now clearly there are times when we all need someone to talk to, when we need a friend. There are real instances of grief and pain that require a caring, sensitive ear. But I'm talking about patterns and stuck states, repeated behavioral sequences that are self-perpetuating and destructive. The more you reinforce them, the more harm you do. The real aim is to show people they can change these patterns, that they can change behaviors. If you believe that you're the ball on the tether, waiting for someone to hit it, that's how you'll behave. If you believe that you're in control, that you can change your patterns, you'll be able to. The trouble is that many times our culture tells us otherwise. It says we don't control our behaviors, we don't control our states, we don't control our emotions. Most of us have adopted a therapeutic model that says we're at the mercy of everything from childhood traumas to raging hormones. So the lesson to learn is that patterns can be interrupted and changed, in an instant. You can use pattern interrupts in daily life. We've all been in arguments that take on a life of their own. The original reason behind the dispute may have long since been forgotten, but we rage on, getting madder and madder, more and more intent on winning, on proving our point. Arguments like this can be the most destructive thing a relationship can face. When they're over, you may think, how in the world did that get so far out of hand? But while the argument is still going on, you have no perspective whatsoever. What if you had a pattern interrupt set up in advance, like an early warning alarm, to short-circuit an argument before it got out of hand? I've found humor is one of the best pattern interrupts. It's hard to be angry when you're laughing. My wife Becky and I have one in place that we use all the time. Have you ever seen the Saturday Night Live skit based on the phrase I hate it when that happens? It's pretty hilarious. The actors tell each other about awful things they do to themselves, like rubbing sandpaper across their lips and then pouring rubbing alcohol on them or grinding a carrot scraper up their nose and then sticking a menthol cough drop there, and then they say, yeah, I know what you mean, I hate it when that happens. So Becky and I have an agreement that when one of us feels an argument is becoming destructive, that partner can say, I hate it when that happens, and the other has to let go. It forces us to break the negative state we're in by thinking of something that makes us laugh. And it also reminds us that we do hate it when we do that. It's about as smart to get in a vicious argument with a person you love as it is to rub sandpaper across your lips and then pour alcohol on them. There are two main ideas in this chapter and they both go against the grain of what many of us have been taught. The first is that you can persuade better through agreement than through conquest. We live in a society that revels in competition, that likes to make clear distinctions between winners and losers, as if every interaction must have both. But everything I know about communication tells me the competition model is very limited. I've already talked about the magic of rapport and how essential it is to personal power. If you see someone as a competitor, someone to be vanquished, you're starting out with the exact opposite framework. Everything I know about communication tells me to build from agreement, not from conflict, to learn to align and lead rather than to try and overcome resistance. This is easier said than done. However, through conscious and consistent awareness, we can change our patterns of communication. The second idea is that our behavior patterns aren't indelibly carved into our brain. If we repeatedly do something that limits us, we're not suffering from some abstruse mental ailment. We're just running a terrible pattern over and over again. It may be a way we relate to others or a way we think. 
The solution is simply to interrupt the pattern, stop what you're doing, and try something new. We're not robots wired into barely remembered personal traumas. If we do something we don't like, all we have to do is recognize it and change it. In both cases, the common ground is the idea of flexibility. If you have trouble putting together a puzzle, you won't get anywhere by trying the same solution time and time again. You'll solve it by being flexible enough to change, to adapt, to experiment, to try something new. The more flexible you are, the more options you create, the more doors you can open, and the more successful you will be. In the next chapter, we'll look at another crucial tool to personal flexibility. It's called Chapter 16, Reframing, The Power of Perspective.